For most of the 13th and early 14th century, England had an almost Mediterranean feel. Bumper crops and a booming economy, and the population doubled. But then, that old enemy of the English struck. No, I don't mean the All Blacks, I mean the weather. Heavy rain and low temperatures caused crops to rot and entire villages to sink. People were starving to death. Surely it couldn't get any worse than this. But it could. On top of the famine came something even more dreadful, the Black Death. An already weakened population was devastated. To many people, it seemed that God had deserted them, and they struggled to reconcile this terrible catastrophe with their beliefs. The Black Death was a catastrophe. But ironically, those who survived found they were better off than they ever had been. You see, the population of England had been almost halved, and labour was scarce, and ordinary farm workers suddenly found they were in a position to call the shots. Peasants began to refuse to fulfil their feudal duties. They started to negotiate wage increases and even began to be paid in hard cash. <laughs> Some left their manors and acquired their own free land. All this, of course, got up the noses of the aristocracy. If there was more wealth around, they saw no reason why the peasants should have it. So they introduced laws to restore compulsory labour and force wages back down to the levels before the Black Death. But what seems to have especially irritated the aristocracy was the way the peasants were dressing. This season's peasant ditched drab workwear in favour of bright colours, tighter hose and even fur. Some peasants were spending almost the same on clothes as certain noblemen. So laws were introduced dictating what different classes could wear. The final straw was when the barons imposed a poll tax to pay for their war in France. This was bitterly resented because it meant that everybody had to pay the same, rich or poor. And to make matters worse, the government got its sums wrong. They based their calculations on the population size before the Black Death. So when they failed to raise the amount they expected, they imposed a second poll tax. And that was when the unthinkable happened. The peasants took up arms and revolted. From all over England, they converged on Canterbury and marched to London, maybe as many as 60,000 of them. With no emails or mobile phones, how could the peasants have organised all this? Could it be that they were making use of their newly acquired literacy to spread word of the revolt? Two of the chroniclers record what they claim were letters that the peasants were circulating amongst themselves. Now, the letters are, are written in English, but they're very cryptic, and we don't really know what they mean but it could be that they contain detailed, coded instructions for the revolt. This is the one in Thomas Walsingham's chronicle. And you can see here it says, John Sheep greeteth well John Nameless and John the Miller, and biddeth them chastise well Hob the Robber, and look, shape you to one head and no more. Knoweth your friend from your foe, have it enough, and say who. Now, it may be that when it says, chastise well, hob the robber, those are instructions to the peasants not to do any looting and only to destroy documents and records. And then it says, look, shape you to one head and no more. Well, it could be just instructions saying, just only have one leader. But on the other hand, it may be instructions to go on pilgrimage to Canterbury, where the peasants assembled first. And the focal point was the head of Thomas a Becket. And finally, it says, Knoweth your friend from your foe, and say who. These could be absolute rigid instructions to distinguish your friends from your enemy by the battle cry. <laughs> the climax of the Peasants' Revolt must rank as one of the most extraordinary scenes in history. Tens of thousands of rebelling peasants confronted the country's aristocracy, led by the king, a 14-year-old boy. The peasant's leader, Wat Tyler, rode towards the boy king to make his demands and then took a swig from a jug of ale, whereupon the mayor of London charged and cut him down. It looked as if the huge throng were about to attack the aristocracy, but the king suddenly rode forward and shouted, I'll be your leader, follow me! The king granted the peasants pardons and promised to abolish serfdom. But 
Once the rebels had dispersed, the barons quickly set about slaughtering the ringleaders. The ideal of freedom and of owing deference to no one was a lasting legacy of the medieval peasant. But there's a sting in the tail to the peasant story. The lords realised that if the peasants were now free from any labour obligation to them, they were likewise free from any obligation to care for their peasants. The social consensus of the feudal system had broken down. And there was worse to come. Peasants were about to come face to face with their real enemy, sheep. You see, your average lord could make more money out of sheep than he could out of peasants. And for a start, there's a lot more wool on a sheep. And you can eat them, which is possible with peasants, but socially tricky. So the lords started to throw the troublesome and uneatable peasants off the land and replace them with these chaps. The social landscape of Britain changed forever.